Oh, it is so fun to be here. This is so exciting. You know, we were talking at dinner about how many of us have been here before, when was our first time, and I remember coming to this conference back in my previous life, long before I studied theology in my corporate world days, I, I, I came to this very conference, was sitting in those seats, just so excited, so eager to learn how to defend the Catholic faith and apologetics, and, uh, and then I came every year when I was a graduate student here at Franciscan University studying in the MA program. Uh, and then I've been able to be blessed to come back uh, a number of times to present here. So I, I, I know what it's like to come to a conference like this. I'm praying for you because there's so much joy and anticipation, and God's going to do amazing things, not just in your understanding of the faith, but hopefully in your heart and the fire of faith in your heart so that you go back and set the world on fire from wherever you're coming from in all the 42 states and three countries that are represented here today. When, when, we, when we start off this presentation here, I want to I tell a story. I'm going to tell a fun story about one of my kids who was a very gifted pianist at the age of two. <laughs> at the age of two, he'd come home from, from church, and he would just go to the piano and play the song that he heard at Mass, do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-
I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to imagine you were a six-year-old boy, six-year-old girl, and let's say you wanted to learn how to play the piano. You were so excited. You heard the piano played once. You said, I want to learn the piano. And imagine if you went to your mom and dad and said, I want to learn how to play the piano, mommy, daddy, can, can, can you help me? And mom and dad says, oh, sure, we'd be glad to help you. Here you go, Johnny. This is what we're going to do. We're going to get you a piano. We're going to put that piano right here in this room, Johnny, and you go in and figure it out all on your own. You're going to be amazing, Johnny, because you're going to be your own piano player. You're going to be so special, Johnny, because you're going to figure out how to express yourself and play the piano in your own way. You are going to be amazing. Go for it, Johnny. And Johnny goes in there, and he plays, and he's playing Twinkle Twinkle, maybe a Yankee Doodle on his own, right? And then let's say he, he tells his music teacher at school, I, I, I want to learn how to play the piano. And the music teacher says, oh, yes, we heard that your parents got you a piano, and, and we want to really affirm you, Johnny. Go figure out how to play the piano all on your own. You're going to be an awesome piano player, Johnny, because you are special. You're your own piano player. Play it however you want. And then the mayor of the town hears about Johnny. Young man, I heard you're figuring out how to be your own piano player. We affirm you. We're going to give you a trophy and a participation ribbon. You got this, Johnny. Imagine Johnny grows up and goes off to college. And he goes off to college and he's meeting other people that play the piano. But these people are playing amazing songs. Imagine like they're playing like a, a Mozart piano concerto and he's hearing the piano played like he's never heard it before. And he goes up to his peers and says, whoa, that's amazing. How, how did you figure out how to do that? What, what, what is this? What are you doing? What are you playing? And they say, oh, it's a Mozart piano concerto. And then Johnny says, what's a Mozart? And then the guy, I guess, oh, no, Mozart's not a what, it's a who. He's a great composer. He, he, wrote, th he wrote this music. What do you mean, he wrote this music? And then they show him, yeah, here on the papers, you know, so here you've got all this, this music here. And Johnny's looking at all this musical notation. But for Johnny, it looks like a foreign language. It's just a bunch of lines with a bunch of dots. And, and Johnny's saying, well, what is all this? And he says, well, every dot corresponds to one of the notes on the keys. He says, wait, wait, where? How, how did you learn this? You mean there's, there's people who wrote music and there's ways to write it down? How did you learn all this? And the guy says, well, our, my teacher, my teacher showed me all this when I was young. And Johnny says, teacher? You mean there's teachers that teach you how to play the piano? Uh, how come no one ever taught me this? How come no one ever gave me this? Imagine if you were Johnny, how would you feel? If you really want to play the piano and you never got a teacher, you never got any training, you never learned about musical history, you never learned about musical theory, musical notation, how would you feel? You'd feel cheated. You'd feel frustrated. You'd feel angry, let down. I share this story because the work Curtis and I are blessed to do is we work with young people all over the country and overseas now. I hear a very similar story, but about something that's so much more important than piano playing. I hear so many young people that are wondering, why didn't anyone teach me how to live? You know, I, I, go, I, I go around, I do a lot of talks on theology of the body. I love speaking to college students and young adults. And, and, and so many of them, when they hear the, the vision of John Paul II on authentic love and, and sexuality and, and, and good principles for dating relationships, they're like, Wow, why didn't anyone tell me that before? How come this is the first time I'm hearing this as an 18-year-old or a 22-year-old or a 23-year-old? It would have saved me from so much heartache, from so many mistakes, from so much hurt. Why didn't anyone tell me this before? I hear this, you take the area of pornography. How many times do we I talk about pornography and I hear from a young man that says, why didn't my dad talk to me? about pornography. Why am I hearing this for the first time? It would have saved me from this addiction. Or, or my wife and I, we do a lot of marriage mentoring for a lot of young couples as they're engaged, they're getting ready for their marriage. It's really awesome. And, uh, but many of them are just so desperate for any guidance they can get on marriage. Many of them maybe came from broken homes. 
so they don't know what marriage really looks like, or if they, their parents stay together, many of those marriages aren't really functioning really well. There's a lot of discord, and they, they, they don't have a great role model. They're just saying, how do you live marriage? And then they get married, and they're raising kids. And How do you do this parenting thing? How do you raise kids? How do you raise them in the faith, in this culture? Many young people today feel cheated, that they feel that there's a great wisdom on how to live life, but they just never got it. You see, what I want to talk about today is not piano. I want to talk about what Pope Benedict called the art of living. Pope Benedict said, in this secular age, as the world has turned away from religion, turned away from God, we've just turned away from just basic human values. And he says that the great challenge that we face in our secular age isn't simply, we don't know the Bible well enough. That is a huge crisis. We need to know the Bible better. But the problem's even deeper. Pope Benedict says it's not just that we don't know enough theology. We need to know theology. We need to know the catechism better. That's a huge problem. But the problem is even deeper. Pope Benedict says we don't even know how to live. We don't know how to live friendship. We don't know how to live dating relationships. We don't know how to live marriage. We don't know how to parent children well. We don't even get bathrooms right in this country. We have lost the art of living, Pope, Francis, Pope Benedict said. We have lost the art of living. The good news is, the good news is there's a great tradition of the art of living. There's a great tradition that goes all the way back to the early church. It goes back to the apostles. It goes back to Jesus. There's a great tradition that goes back even further in the Old Testament. You see in the Old Testament scriptures, the four key habits on how to live life well. The four key virtues in the Old Testament Jewish scriptures, they understood this. And you didn't even have to come from the Judeo-Christian tradition. There were people like Plato and Aristotle and Socrates. They saw that there were four basic virtues, human virtues that we need to thrive on a human level. Now, if I had more time, I'd love to talk about the three key virtues, the theological virtues we need, ultimately, as human persons, faith, hope, and charity. But for our time today, we're going to focus on these four natural virtues known as the cardinal virtues. They're called cardinal because the word cardinal comes from the Latin word meaning hinge. All of the other virtues are connected. They hinge to these four. And I like to say that our lives hinge on these four virtues. And what, what's sad is that this was just the basic stuff, the art of living the, the, uh, that was passed on from one generation to the next. But we don't know this anymore. Yeah, I would say 95% of the people out there in the secular world have never heard of the four cardinal virtues. Sadly, probably 90% of Catholics have never heard of the four cardinal virtues. This is just basic stuff. Now, there are many of you going, okay, what are those four cardinal virtues? <laughs> and so there, there's going to be some of you that's in the 98th percentile. You know those four cardinal virtues. You know prudence. You know temperance. You know fortitude. And you know justice. You know the four cardinal virtues. But I would say 98% of those in the 98th percentile, the vast majority of them would have no idea how those four virtues actually relate together. What are the three key sub-virtues you need to be a prudent person to live with wise decision-making? What are the key sub-virtues you need to be a courageous man? What are the vices that undermine that? And, and, and we're, gonna, we're not going to get into all that tonight, but I just want you to know that there was a basic way of living life that was passed on from father to son. And, and this wasn't just really complex philosophy. This was just like the ABCs of how to live life. Passed on from father to son, from grandfather to grandson, from uncle to nephew, from master to apprentice, from pastor to to his flock. This was passed on from generation to generation. But over the last 250-ish years, since the period known as the Enlightenment, which we don't have time to get into, but, but a period that just said, well, we're going to set all that aside. We're going to become independent thinkers. We're going to think for ourselves and just figure out life for ourselves. How does that go for Johnny? Johnny's never going to be able to figure out how to play the piano greatly with excellence all on his own. And for something so much more important, we're never going to figure out how to live life and make a beautiful song with our lives for God and for others 
all on our own. We need the tradition of the virtues. I'm going to talk about that great tradition. Are you ready for that? Let's turn to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Let's ask her to pray for us. She who had the virtues perfected in her, may she intercede for us as we begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So all I'm going to be sharing with you is from this book I wrote called The Art of Living, where I try to make it really practical, and that's what I'm going to share with you here in this brief introduction tonight. And I want to first talk about flying. Does anyone like flying? Does anyone like being in a plane? I love flying. I remember as a kid, I would go on trips with my dad, and we'd be up in the air, and it's just something fun about being 38,000 feet in the air, and you're above the clouds. It's sunny up there, cloudy down there. I just loved being on a plane, and I still kind of get a kick out of flying to this day. So let's say, how many people, who had to fly here? Anyone have to fly here? Anyone close up here in the front row? You had to fly, where'd you fly from? Phoenix, okay, what's your name? Cindy, so Cindy, if I told you, oh Cindy, I love flying. I am passionate about flying. Oh, I, I, I value flying. I get strong feelings about flying. Cindy, let me fly you back to Phoenix. <laughs> Would you, Cindy, get in the airplane with me as your pilot? No way. <laughs> I don't have the skills of a pilot. You wouldn't want that. We'd crash. Similar story. My father was a surgeon, and I grew up being able to meet his patients learn about his surgeries, looking at pictures of his surgeries. I grew up kind of weird. I would look at his anatomy books and learn about, oh, here's where all the bones and the ligaments are. So I, I grew up learning about surgery. And to this day, I hold surgeons in high esteem. But let's say I heard, what is your name right there? Tom. Let's say, Tom, I heard you needed surgery. I said, oh, hey, Tom, I love surgery. <laughs> I really value surgery. I, I get excited about surgery, and I, I have all the intentions in the world to perform an awesome surgery for you. Would you get on the operating table here with me and let me perform that surgery? Oh, he's the surgeon, right? I so say you might trust him. <laughs> but Tom, you wouldn't trust me, right? No, I'm not that kind of doctor. Yeah, that's right. So this is all common sense, right? Nobody gets into an airplane with a guy that doesn't have the skills of a pilot, and no one jumps on an operating table with someone that doesn't have the skills of a surgeon. And yet, how many people today jump into friendships, jump into dating relationships, business partnerships, marriages, without ever asking the question of virtue? Without ever asking the question of virtue, the, does this person have the virtue to love me, to serve me, to live in this relationship well? Do they have the skill to love me? Now, there's many ways to look at virtue, but one analogy that gets, it doesn't get all of it, but gets a good part of it, is the thing of virtue is the basic life skills that we need to live well, to love, to serve, to be reliable, to fulfill our commitments, to give the best of ourselves to, uh, to another person. That's what the catechism says. Virtue allows us to give the best of ourselves to God and to others. So no matter how many feelings I have or how much I value something, that's not nearly as important as whether I have the character on the inside, the virtue, the ability to love. Because here's the deal, my friends. Anyone can say I love you. Anyone can say those words. Some people might sincerely mean it. But it's only the person who possesses virtue that's capable of loving. I'm going to say that again. Anyone can say, I love you. Some people might sincerely mean it, but it's only the person who possesses virtue that's capable of loving you. You see, when I grew up, I grew up, I was blessed with a great Catholic school and parish growing up, and I remember hearing about the virtues, and they'd have banners up at church with naming some of the different virtues, and I think I had a, a kind of individualistic understanding of the virtues, though. Individualistic in the sense like they, they were from me. This is what I need to be a better person, what I need to improve for my own self-improvement project so I can be the, the best person I can be. I need virtue. And I, I, I would be interested in, about those virtues. You know, I'd want to learn more about uh, piety, fear of the Lord, wisdom, 
I want to learn about courage. I want to learn about uh, temperance. So, so, but these were all kind of like for me, so I could be a better person. They were more for me. It was like, they were like badges, like badges I can earn to be a good Boy Scout for Jesus. I got the fortitude badge. Okay, now I'm going to go after patience. And, you know, but it was all about me. And, and, and certainly it is, virtue does help you be a better person. But I realized over time from studying Aquinas and Aristotle, but just living life, particularly in marriage and family, that virtue isn't about just me. My wife needs me to be virtuous. <laughs> My children are depending on me growing in virtue. My colleagues, my friends, my fellow parishioners, the people that read my books, they need me to grow in virtue. Because here, here's the thing, the more I grow, let's just say, in generosity, in patience, in courage, and prudence, the more I can do generous, patient, prudent, and courageous things, to help other people and bless them in their lives. But to the extent that I struggle with generosity, to the extent I'm self-centered, I'm not thinking about other people, I'm thinking about myself and what I want and what I need to get done, like to the extent I struggle with generosity, that's not just an Edward Sree problem. That's a Beth Sree problem. It's a problem for my wife because I won't be able to love her the way she deserves to be loved, the way I want to love her. The extent I struggle with generosity, I, I will do selfish things that hurt my wife. I, I don't want to do those selfish things. I don't want to hurt my wife. But because I'm not as generous as I need to be, I'll, I'll tend to be focused more on myself. Or, or if I struggle in patience, if I struggle in patience, that's not just an Edward Sree problem. That's a problem for my kids. So when I get stressed out and I'm a little too intense and I lose my temper with my kids, I, I hurt them. And I have to go to them and say, I I'm sorry. Dad just lost his temper. I shouldn't have lost my temper like that. I shouldn't have treated you like that. Will you forgive me? I, I, I don't want to hurt my kids. I, I love my kids. I, I really value them. But if I struggle with patience, I will do impatient things that hurt the people around me. When I lack courage, courage isn't just something for me so I can be courageous on the soccer field or, you know, in, on the battlefield or whatever. No, no, no. Courage is something... I just need for everyday life. I need to be able to deal with difficulties and challenges. So let's say at, in the workplace, let's say the board of directors says, well, we want to do this whole big new initiative. And my team over here is already, their plate's already full. They're struggling already with just what they have to do. And I have to go and tell them if I lack courage and I'm like, oh, I don't know how we're going to do this. Oh, I'm like Eeyore. Oh, no, life is going to be really hard now. That's not helpful for my team. My team needs me to have courage. My team needs me to roll up the sleeves. Okay, all right, guys, we got this thing coming down from the board. I know you have a lot going on. This is going to be hard. I know we're stretched already, but I believe in this team. I believe we can figure it out. We can reprioritize. We're going to do this. They need me to be courageous. And when I lack courage, I'm not able to help my team. When I lack prudence and I just fill up the social calendar with all these people coming over, my wife's like, can I just have some time to go to Costco? You know, like, like I'm not prudently thinking through the time or thinking through the budget of our money and I'm just spending, like my lack of prudence affects my family. Here's the key thing I want you to take away. Virtue gives us the freedom to love. Virtue gives us the freedom to love. To the extent I'm struggling in virtue, to that extent, I'm simply not free to love the people around me. No matter how much I may want to love them, no matter how much I value them, no matter how many feelings I have for them, I need to grow in virtue so I can give the best of myself to the people around me. Now, I'm going to give an example here from my own life. When I talk about virtue and I give examples from my life, it's usually on the non-virtuous side. So here we go. You ready? So um, I, I, true story. My wife and I, we, we were living in an apartment first two years of our marriage, and then we moved into our first house. And I was all excited. We have a, a, a house that had a, a front porch deck, and then we had this back porch deck in this massive backyard. So just picture this. This is my first house. It's got a big backyard, and it's got a deck in that backyard. Gentlemen, what's the last thing I need? There we go. We got it. <laughs> we need the grill. And my mom, who's amazing, I am blessed with an awesome mom. 
Um, and, and she wanted to get us for our anniversary in our new house, a housewarming gift, she wanted to get us a grill. And she told me, hey, a grill's gonna come by UPS. It's gonna come on this day and you can be ready for it. And I was so excited. I had, I had the steaks, you know, I went to the steak store that morning. I'm getting them marinated all day and I'm waiting for the grill to come. Now, before I continue the story, I want to tell you something else about myself. Uh, any gentlemen here, well, I'll just ask everybody. Anyone love St. Joseph? We just had the big year of St. Joseph. Are you all love Joseph? I'll say as a Catholic husband, a Catholic dad, Joseph has always been a great role model for me, a great patron. I turn to Joseph every day, and I want to imitate him. But there's one quality of Joseph's I know I will never possess, and that's his carpentry skills. <laughs> Joseph was a carpenter. And I'm really good at breaking things. <laughs> Whenever something's broken in the house and I'm trying to fix this pipe or something, my wife's like, um, hey, could we just call someone? <laughs> Second year of marriage, my in-laws got me one of those black and yellow books called Home Improvement for Dummies. I was like, thank you. Oh, wait, what are you saying about me? <laughs> so here I am, and it's getting late in the afternoon. I'm wondering, man, is that girl going to show up? Is it going to be here? And, and finally, UPS shows up around 3.30, 4 o'clock. There it is. And this big box comes out. I'm so excited. I take the box, push it across the front porch, push it through the backyard, push it out of the back deck. I'm so excited to open up my new grill. I open up the box, and to my dismay, I look inside, and there's not a grill inside. There's not a grill inside this box. It's just a bunch of pieces with an instruction manual. And my heart sinks. I'm like, oh, no. And, and I just know I'm really not good at this kind of stuff. So here I am. I'm carefully trying to take every piece out, put them in the right groupings, and read the instruction manual word for word very carefully because I will just mess this up. I know it. And it's got like 25 steps to it. And this is just really stressful. And it's late in the afternoon. I got to get the stakes going. And I got to put this all together now. So I'm a little stressed out. You ever been stressed out about something? Well, here I was. And um, at this moment, so I'm laying all the pieces out, and then my little one-year-old comes hobbling in and starts messing with the pieces, and I'm like, uh, honey, can we, can we keep the baby out of here, please? And, you know, I'm a little stressed, and I'm working through it, though. I'm trying my best just to, okay, persevere, concentrate, follow the directions very carefully. And, you know, I get to about step 16, and, and things are, are, are starting to turn a corner. They're looking good. In other words, it's starting to look like a grill. You know, you can see the shape, and I'm thinking, wow, okay, maybe, you know, we're getting close to the, to the end here, and I'm all excited. Then I turn the page in the instruction manual, and all of a sudden I realize, oh, no, I skipped step six. And I've got to dismantle all my work for the last hour and go all the way back to step six. And I am just about to lose it at this point. And at this moment... My wife, the great, you know, cheerleader trying to encourage me and, you know, be there for me. She's like, oh, hey, honey, it's looking really good. You know, it's starting to look like a grill. You got this. And I'm like, um, actually, it's not good, honey. I, I, I skipped step six. It's really a, a real mess right now. And then the baby comes in again, messing with the piece. Like, can we keep the baby out of here? Have you ever been around people like that? You're like, oh, okay, we'll just leave. <laughs> and I realized that day that, my lack of virtue, my lack of patience, or actually Aquinas would describe this as a lack of perseverance, persevering through difficult things. My lack of virtue isn't a problem just for me, but my lack of virtue in this area is keeping me from being the husband I want to be to Beth and from, from loving my little new daughter the way I want to love her. And that's why the pursuit of virtue isn't just like, oh, I just want to get better. No, no, people are depending on you. God's depending on you. Your spouse, your children, your friends, your parish are depending on all of us to take virtue seriously, to really grow in the imitation of Jesus Christ in his virtue. That's what it means to be a disciple, to imitate Jesus. That's what holiness is all about, imitating Jesus, loving like him, thinking like him, serving like him, forgiving like him. But that just doesn't happen magically. Oh, I'm just going to start forgiving everyone. And then your spouse says something that upsets you. Why'd you do that? Oh, wait, I'm supposed to forgive people. You know? and, and, and so we, we need to really make this a priority to go after this. Now, I, I want to share with you another thing here. Any soccer fans here? Any soccer fans? 
So in the Street family, we're all really big soccer fans. And so all my kids play soccer. We watch soccer. We love soccer. Uh, and I, I'll organize games in the park sometimes for some of the young focus missionaries, young Augustine Institute students, young adults in the Denver area, and then old dads like me and my kids and other kids are playing. It's, it's you know, it's a lot, it's family, it's a lot of fun, but I'll tell you, it gets really competitive. <laughs> Um, and, and my kids are awesome. They play at the, all of my kids are on the top team in their soccer, competitive soccer club, and they've gotten great training. They have great coaches, and they're the kind of people like you pass the ball, it's in the air, and they just like take it out of the air. They have great touch. They, they can dribble well. They can make the right move. They look up. They can make a good pass. They can, they can score. They can shoot. They, you give the ball to my kids, and you know they're going to do good things. When you pass the ball to Dr. Shree, on the other hand, it's a different story. See, I love soccer, and I follow soccer, but I never had all that great coaching. So I'm excited. I like to get out there, but it's like 50-50 on whether Dr. Shree is going to do something good with the ball or he's going to give it up. And so in critical moments of the game, like, you know, my teammate may have the ball, and I'm over here wide open. I'm like, hey, I, I'm open. And then the guy goes, he looks at me. He's like, yeah, hey, I'm going to just pass to one of your kids. <laughs> he doesn't want to pass to me. I wouldn't want to pass to me at a critical moment of the game because I know I'm not reliable. I'm not dependable. I don't have the skill. And, 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 and I think that's the question I want to ask you here tonight. The people around you, would your spouse say that you're reliable? That when your spouse has something to share, you're not going to be critical. You're not going to shoot it down. You're not going to be negative. You're not going to be distracted. You're not going to be pulling out your phone. You're going to really listen. Would, you, would your spouse say you're reliable? Would your kids say you're dependable? You're not just there every once in a while. You're not just there at, you know, at great dad time, but like you're consistently dependable, reliable for them. Would the people at work think that of you? You know, I know in the office, there's some people I know of like, wow, we got a big deadline and I need extra help on this thing. I know there's certain people I can go to. If I give the ball to them, they're going to get it done. They're going to take care of it really well. I don't have to think about it. And I know that there's other people, if I give the ball to them, they're going to be stressed out. They go, um, uh, I have too many things going on. I, and so I don't even bother. Or, or there's somebody else I want to give the ball to, or they want to volunteer. But I'm like, well, actually, if I give it to them, they're not going to take care of it well. Do you know what I'm talking about? We all have people like that in our families, in our workplace, in our communities. What kind of person are you? Are you the kind of person that's reliable? Are you dependable? Because that's what the art of living is all about, growing in virtue. So we, we can be the kind of people others can lean on in life. I want to talk about what virtue is. Here you go. Definition from the catechism right there. Catechism 1803. What is virtue? It's a habitual and firm disposition to do the good. I want to be clear. Some people think, oh, virtue, it's a habit. I want to be clear. Nope, it's much more than that. You can have a habit of speeding. You can have the habit of sleeping in. You can have, have the habit of picking your nose. There are many habits you can have. This is the firm and habitual disposition to do the good. And what you want to do is consider the four characteristics of virtue. Do you have these four characteristics? So for example, do you do the good consistently? Not just every once in a while. You volunteered this week at the parish to set up chairs. That doesn't give you the Christian Service of the Year Award. That's the first time you volunteered in five years. Awesome moment. The angels are rejoicing. That's great. But you're not consistent. You're not the kind of person the Father just goes, oh, they're always there. I can count on them. They're dependable. Do you do it consistently? Do you do it easily? Is it second nature? Or is it kind of like, okay, Father's looking for some help, and I'm like, well, I guess I got to do it, but man, I really got to get back and watch the game, but all right, I'll, I'll, I'll help. And, you know, you're not, it's not easy for you. It's not second nature for you to just serve, drop what you're doing, your priorities to serve someone else. Do you do it promptly? Do you do it right away? Is it like, okay, Father says, hey, can I, anyone help with the chairs? And you're like, oh, I hope he doesn't choose me. <laughs> No, no, the virtuous person that really has the virtue of, of, of being able to serve easily, like that, it's just, just who they are. They're like, oh yeah, let me help. And then, do you do it with joy? Or are you grumbling? You know, these are four characters. I think about like a PGA golfer. PGA golfer can go up right up to the tee, hits that ball down the fairway really far, down the middle consistently. And it's easy for them. It's just a part of who they are. They don't have to really think about it a lot. They can do it promptly. You know, it's like second nature. And, and when they play, they play with such excellence, it's fun for them. When I play golf, every once in a while, I hit it down the fairway. It's pretty amazing. 
Most of the time, it's over there in the forest or there in the pond. You know, I'm not consistent. And it's not easy for me. I don't do a prom. I'm the kind of guy that has to take like 20 practice swings because I'm just so nervous I'm going to make a mistake. And when I play, there's usually not a lot of joy. <laughs> so we want to ask ourselves about these four characteristics of virtue. How do we grow in them? How can I grow in, in consistency? E how can I do it more easily? How can I do it more promptly? How can I do it joyfully? All right. I, I want to talk a little bit. I mentioned to you about the four cardinal virtues and how they relate together. Uh, and I, I'm going to share with you a story, a true story here. So years ago, so I do pilgrimages to Rome each year. And when my kids turn nine, they get to go with dad on the dad trip to Rome. And I remember taking my son with me one year, my son Paul. And he's there, and I give them like a little mini kids syllabus where they have to read about the saints and read about the art and some of the history ahead of time. They have to write little, short little essays. It's not really intense, don't worry. But, but I do something like this with them. And, and then on the plane over, I, I, I bring some of these art books, and I'm trying to give them an experience of it before they get there so they really like it. And we're looking at some of the art in the, in the Vatican museums, and there's this beautiful depiction of the four cardinal virtues by Raphael, the Renaissance artist. And I, I'm sharing it with my son, and, and I'm showing it. He goes, oh, what is that? And he says, and I say, oh, those are the, each of those little angels represent one of the four cardinal virtues. And then my nine-year-old says, what's a cardinal virtue? And my heart sank. I thought, how do I explain this? I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm used to teaching this to adults, college students and above. But how do I explain the four cardinal virtues to a nine-year-old. <laughs> this was really hard for me. So I'm trying to think, okay, I need a story. I need some kind of analogy here. What do I do? So I said, okay, Paul, so let's say we have to get to the Vatican Museums. You know, we have the group tickets, and we have to be there by 8.30. And if we're late, we're going to miss the entrance in the Vatican Museums. It's, it's important we're there no later than 8.30. Our hotel is 15 minutes walk away from the Vatican Museum. So when, when should we leave? He does the math in his head. 8.15? I said, yep, 8.15, maybe even like 8 o'clock just in case something gets wrong. We get there a little early. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, that's good. I go, that's, that's the first virtue, Paul, of prudence. It's beginning with the goal. What's the goal in mind? And then you're going backwards and trying to think, what do you, what do you need to do to, to get there? And he's like, oh, okay. All right. Then I said to him, all right, so what's, what's the next virtue here? All right, well, let's say we're on our way to the Vatican Museums but it's a downpouring rain. We're at the hotel door and it's just pouring rain and it's cold and it's windy and you're going to be really uncomfortable on your way there. You might be tempted to say, Dad, can we just stay at home? I don't want to go out in the cold and the wind and the rain. You need a virtue that's going to help you do difficult things to persist against the difficulties that come up and the suffering and the pain that will come up in life. That virtue is called courage or fortitude. All right, but let's say it's a beautiful sunny day and you're on your way to the Vatican Museums, there's another virtue you're going to need. Uh, let's say that you're on your way there, and there's a gelato store right there. And there's a big sign that says, free unlimited gelato for the next hour. You would be really tempted, and understandably so, uh, to, to, to just want to just go and eat all that gelato. <laughs> but you need a virtue, not just one that helps you persist against the difficulties in life, but you need a virtue that helps moderate your attraction to, to other fun things and things that are pleasurable and delightful, enjoyable, like food and drink. And we didn't get into the sex thing yet. So, but, 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 so, but, but I use that as an example. And then what if I said, well, Paul, let's say, you know, dad's done this trip so many times and I've been to the Vatican museums a lot. And I know I put on the itinerary, we're going to go to the Vatican museums and everyone's looking forward to it. But I just, I just don't want to go this year. What would you think? He said, oh, no, dad, that wouldn't be fair. You need another virtue called justice, where we fulfill our responsibilities to others, to God and to the people in our lives. Modern America, I didn't get into this, and we focus on justice as rights. What do other people owe me? A Catholic, a truly Catholic understanding of, right, of, of justice is more outward looking, my responsibility toward God and toward others. So that's a little bit of a little simple kid's version of the four cardinal virtues and how to re relate them together. I go into the, each of those virtues more in depth, all the sub-virtues and the different vices that try to undermine it uh, in the book here. But what I want to do is close and talk about the three ways we grow in virtue. So in the last 10 minutes here, I was, oh, wait, actually, no, I forgot. I want to talk about this here. Anyone been to London? 
Anyone been to London? Okay, in London, you go down on the subway system and you see these three words everywhere, right? They're on the walls, they're on the platform, they're on the loudspeakers. Mind the gap, mind the gap, mind the gap, right? Well, what's, what's that all about? What is the gap all about? You see, because if you're on the platform of the train and you're waiting for the subway to come, there's a gap between where you're standing and where the train is coming. So what happens if you don't mind the gap? What's going to happen? You're going to, you're going to fall. So you got to mind the gap. And, and my question for you tonight, my friends, is this. Do you mind the gaps in your lives? Are you aware of the gaps you have in your life? Are you aware of the gaps you have in your relationship with God? Start there. Are you aware of the ways maybe you're not following his will, his plan? Are you, ways, uh, are you aware of the ways that you don't pray consistently? Because prayer is a virtue. It's consistently giving yourself to God. Do you have that time every day? Do you have like at least 20 minutes a day of quiet time of conversation with God? Not just saying prayers, not just doing devotions like the rosary, but time for intimate conversation with God. Every Christian needs this. Are you aware of the gaps that, well, I pray when it fits in my schedule. I pray when I like to. I pray when I come to a conference like this. But I don't have the virtue, the habit of prayer in my daily life. Are you aware of that gap? And are you trying to close that gap? Are you going to be committed? I'm going to, I'm going to try to be better at this. Are you aware of the gap in your marriage? Are you aware of the ways that you don't thank your spouse enough? You don't honor your spouse enough? Are you aware of the ways you, you don't serve your spouse and think about her needs are you aware of the gaps in, in, in how you don't listen to her heart? That she keeps sharing things with you and you just keep saying, well, it's not like that, and you're, but you're not really listening. Maybe God's inviting you to work on that gap in your life. Are you aware of the gaps with your children? Maybe there's a child that needs more of your discipline. They need you to speak in and they need you to train them more. Maybe there's a child that there's some strain and, and, and they actually need less. They don't need your discipline as much as they need your love. They just need your time and attention. They need to know that you love them no matter what they do in life and how they perform in school and on the, on the field and in their job and in college, that they know your unconditional love for them. Are you aware of the gaps in your life? Because the pursuit of virtue is going to be all about looking at those key relationships, love of God and love of neighbor and the people in my lives, and how do I bridge those gaps by growing in virtue there? Let's talk about practically then. How do we grow in virtue? Three ways. Three ways to grow in virtue. And I want to share with you, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm going to present here is not Edward Street's. Here's his three favorite ways to grow in virtue. This is not my own private opinion. This is what the church teaches. This is right here in the catechism. This is from the heart of the church. Three ways to grow in virtue. First, we have to educate ourselves in the virtues. We have to learn about the virtues. We have to understand what they are. Like, again, most of us didn't grow up learning about them. And if I, if I fill my mind with just Netflix and Instagram stories and reels. I, I'm not training my mind to know the virtuous life, the art of living. Learning about the art of living is so much more important than whatever's trending on social media. Where are you spending more time? Looking at something on your phone or forming your mind with the word of God? Forming your mind with the saints. I think one of the best ways, two great ways to learn about the virtues. First of all, you gotta read about them. You can go to the catechism. We'll give you a very brief introduction. I wrote a book on the virtues. You don't have to read mine. Peter Kreeft has a wonderful old book from the 90s called Back to Virtue. Uh, the, uh, Donald DeMarco with Ignatius Press had a number of books called The Heart of Virtue, where he's using stories from history and the saints and literature. Uh, but I think one of the best ways to learn about the virtues is to fill your mind with the stories of the saints. These are men and women who've been transformed by Jesus Christ. These are men and women in whom the virtues have been perfected. And when you learn about how Therese of Lisieux, when somebody annoyed her, she didn't complain. How she would go out of her way to spend time with people that hurt her, that frustrated her. Because she, she, wanted, she rose above her feelings, her passions, her emotions. We live in such an age where if somebody bothers me, I just ghost them. Like I, I won't even talk to them anymore. I, you know, so many guys today break up over text, or maybe they don't even do that. They just don't even return a text message. And, and women are left heartbroken and totally dishonored. Again, we, we've lost the basics of how to live life. A guy doesn't know how to ask a girl out anymore, and a guy doesn't know how to break up with a girl anymore. We've lost the art of living, my friends. We need to learn the basics of virtue. And when you read the saints, you get a great example in your life of this is what I want to aim for. This is what I want to run after in my own lives. I don't want to be a slave to my fears, a slave to my 
my passions, my attraction to pleasure. I want to be like the saints, like Mary, and rise above those emotions so I can give my life as a gift to God and others. So, but I can't do that if I don't educate myself in the virtues. If I don't even know the virtues, if I don't even know what are the vices that undermine the virtues in my life, I can't even begin to work on them. I'll tell you this, this personal in my own life. So I, I have a PhD, I studied theology, and I, I had classes in Rome on Aquinas and the virtues, and it was all great. But for me, it was a lot up here. I mean, it inspired me a bit, but it was much more about the head. And then I remember I was asked to teach moral theology at Benedictine College. I never had to teach a whole class. I'd done a lot of scripture classes, but they asked me to teach the moral theology class, and I knew I needed to go back to the virtues. And I was reading Aquinas that whole summer, and it, it changed my life. I'd read Aquinas before. It wasn't my first dance with Aquinas, but it was a whole new place for me. I'm getting ready to teach a whole class on this, so I was really paying close attention. But even more than that, where I was in my state in life, I was just starting my career, we're launching Focus. I'm newly married. We have our first child and a second one on the way, and I'm at a whole different place. So as I'm reading Aquinas, it was like an examination of conscience. And I was seeing this is what virtue is, and this is what enables us to love. And I was seeing in my own home how I fall short for my poor wife, and I fall short for my poor daughter, and I, I just I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better dad. I, I need to grow in virtue. And so it's, but until I even understand what the virtuous life is, I can't even begin to go for it and, and try to grow in the virtues. You know, there's that saying, if you aim for nothing, you'll hit it every time. And I think that's how Catholics kind of just go through life. I mean, we pray and we do holy hours and we, we have devotions, but we're not aiming at imitating Jesus enough. And that has to be the heart of our walk with God. Second thing, to grow in virtue. The, uh, the catechism tells us we have to put in much effort. I can't just pray about the virtues or read the virtues and memorize the virtues. I got to work really hard. In the Catholic tradition, the great way to overcome our vices isn't just to say no to our vices. Okay, I'm not going to eat that second cookie. I'm not going to eat that second cookie. No, no, no. The best way to practice growing in the virtue, if I'm too attached to sweets or eating too much, the best thing is to practice the opposite virtue, which is the virtue of fasting, Aquinas says. If I practice fasting in other areas of my life, with other foods and drinks or, or my screens or whatever, I'm, I'm practicing that moral muscle of self-control. Or I'll use an example for those that were at the, the biblical conference. Earlier today, I gave a talk, and I talked about anxiety and how we live in such a world of, of great anxiousness. Everyone's worried about something. We have to manage and control everything. Well, if you struggle with anxiety, the best thing to do isn't simply say, I'm not going to be anxious. I'm not going to be anxious. I'm not going to let myself get afraid. No, no. No, it's practice the other virtue. Aquinas says you have to grow in confidence in God's providence. Do you really trust your heavenly Father has a plan for you? And he knows what's best for you, better than you do. And he's going to take care of you no matter what happens. You want to have Romans 8.28 on your mind. Where St. Paul says, in all things, God works for good in those who love him. Do you really believe that? Have that, that verse on your mind. The next time you're anxious, remind yourself. The inspired word of God through the great apostle St. Paul says, in all things, God works for good in those who love him, in all things, no matter what's happening right now that I'm all worried and anxious about, no matter what might happen in the future that I'm so afraid about, the next time I, I, I feel that anxiety, arm myself with the word of God. Remember the truth of God's providential care that in all things, God works for good in those who love him. Growing in virtue takes a lot of effort. We have to practice the virtues that, uh, that, that, under, that cut out the weaknesses and vices we struggle with. But the last one here is the one we have to take in the most. We have to learn to rely on God's grace. That no matter how much I study the virtues, no matter how much I try and put all this effort in, I'm going to fall short. I'm fallen. We're going to fall. We're going to make mistakes. We're not going to be able to climb the ladder of virtue on our own. Only Jesus can do that with me. So through prayer, and through the sacraments, and learning not to be self-reliant. Because when I'm self-reliant, and I think I can do it, I got to come up with this plan, I'm going to read this book, and I'm going to grow in one virtue each week of Lent next year. That's usually a, a recipe for disaster. Because I'm, I, I, I'm depending on me to grow in virtue. I'll end up failing. I'll end up condemning myself and going, oh, I'm just, I'm never going to change. I'll fall into despair. We have to learn that God wants to meet us down low 
in our weakness, in those areas where we're struggling, in those gaps, those gaps in our lives, God wants to meet you right there in those gaps. And if you come to him humbly and honestly and beg him, Jesus, help me, lift me, transform me, his grace will change you. As St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, we are being changed into his likeness from one degree of glory to another. And that happens when we educate ourselves in the virtue, we put in much effort, but most of all, we learn to meet Jesus in the valley, in the gaps of our lives, and allow his grace to lift us up and transform us. So what I want to do here is I'm going to close this with a prayer, and then we're going to take time to, to worship God together in a song. But let's, let's gather all of our thoughts, and, and, and I want to just say this. If, to grow in virtue, make sure these three steps here, I saw nobody taking pictures of it. Keep that in mind. Learn about them. Put in much effort. Rely on God's grace. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, you told us that we are called to be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect. Perfected in virtue, perfected in love. But we're honest, Jesus. That seems like such a tall order. It, it, it seems like such a tall mountain to climb. I know my own weakness, my own fears, the, the hurts from my past that keep me from growing in virtue. I know the many vices that weigh me down. I keep bringing them to confession, Lord. But I do believe that even in my weakness, your strength is made manifest and perfected. And so we want to rely on you, Jesus. May your grace through the, the conference, the speakers, through the conversations, and most of all, through adoration, through mass, through confession this weekend, may we meet you in the valley and may you lift us up and may we be conformed to you, to love like you, in Jesus' name, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thanks so much, and God bless.